everybody for uh, taking the time to join us this morning. Um, we've already introduced ourselves, but again, from the top, uh, my name's Les. Uh, I'm joined today by, by James, uh, and we're going to talk to you about PSM 7.2. Um, so me and James make up uh, two thirds of the product specialist team, which is a polite way of saying, you know, we scope out uh, larger projects. Um, we uh, make recommendations on kit for uh, medium to large orders. So you're in safe hands today. This webinar uh, is going to cover uh, a few features of 7.2. Won't cover everything. If I did cover everything, I'd have you here all week, and I don't want to do that to you lovely people. Uh, so we'll start off with taking the leap to 7.2, which had about uh, the upgrade process itself. Uh, we'll move on to uh, immutable data storage and backups, uh, which is something that we put a lot of focus on for this release. Um, we'll talk about changes to the storage pools themselves, which is, of course, the core of what we do here at Synology. Um, and also, we'll talk a bit about our Teams notification integration, which is a feature that I, as an Exodus admin, was uh, particularly excited about. Finally, we'll wrap it up with a few other big improvements that uh, probably didn't warrant uh, their own section of their own, but uh, a few other exciting things to share at the end. So to start with, when it's time to upgrade, just a few things to consider. Firstly, and most obviously, does your current hardware support the upgrade? Now, we've gone back fairly far. I can't quote all of the models off my head, um, but uh, double check on the website. Um, when you go onto the page that I'll link you to in a moment, um, you'll be able to select the latest firmware for your model. Um, and if it doesn't say 7.2, then unfortunately, you know, maybe time to upgrade. Um, once you've checked you're compatible, you might want to just back up your config data. It's pretty easy to do. You just go into the control panel on the Synology device update and restore, and in that menu, there's an option for configuration backup. And the last thing, of course, just schedule a little bit of downtime. Starting off with our first demo, how to upgrade to 7.2. So at this point, we're going to assume that you've already grabbed the firmware file, um, which you can grab from the link above. Um, and if uh, you're watching this on the YouTube later down the line, you can scan the QR code. That will, again, take you to the relevant download page. You can stick in the uh, model of the device you're trying to upgrade. Uh, and it will give you the uh, right firmware file for you. Once you've got that file, uh, you are just going to go into a control panel and you're going to go into update and restore and your DSM update. You can't see it here, but you're just going to go into a standard Windows Explorer, go into your downloads folder, select that file and hit OK. And it'll take a little bit of time. Uh, how much time it takes will depend on the unit itself uh, and the configuration. When you're done, you go back into your control panel, you should see under DSM update that you're now on version 7.2. Although this was taken at the beginning of the month um, in, when it was still in beta, so the exact version will probably vary from the one that you see. Now that we're upgraded, let's move on to talk about a couple of the features. Now, again, data security and immutable storage was one of the key focus areas for this release. Um, Everyone's uh, increasingly concerned about ransomware as ransomware becomes more and more sophisticated and more and more prevalent on the internet. So here are just a couple of uh, things that we've added to, uh, to add additional protection to your devices. First thing that we've added is uh, what we like to call one, which stands for write once and read many. Um, this is our simplified model for adding immutable storage uh, pools to the NAS offering. Uh, it's quite granular in how it can be configured and how it can be set up. So uh, the first feature of the tamper-proof clock is your duration. How long do you want to protect this data for? Maybe you have a six-month contract that can't be, uh, can't be adjusted in that six-month period. Maybe you have data that you're keeping for three years uh, for GDPR compliance. Um, you can set data to be immutable for uh, an indefinite period of time. That bit's up to you. Uh, the next function that we have is a grace period. Maybe, again, you're working on a, a contract with uh, an external contact, and it's going to be protected once it's finalized. But it's not quite over the line yet. You might need to make a, a couple of changes. So uh, you can set a grace period, perhaps sort of seven days, 24 hours, you know, um, and during that duration, you can go in, you can make changes. But once it's reached that period where everything should be done and dusted, that's when your, um, your immutable period kicks in and no more changes will be allowed at that point. Uh, we also have an appendable mode, which means that if you're working on um, a document that will be expanding, you can always add more information to it. The only thing you can't do is change any previous information, so nothing can be lost, but uh, the file can grow over time as you add more information to it. 
Uh, and also we've, uh, we've included this functionality for uh, backup snapshots. Um, so uh, as well as individual folder shares uh, being protected and volumes, you can, uh, you can have snapshot backups that are also protected by immutable storage um, to save and recover from, uh, from snapshots at a schedule that you set. Finally, there is uh, the admin only overwrite function, um, which is applied in, uh, in enterprise mode, but not compliance mode. What this means is, you know, if there is an error, if a file is uploaded an error um, in enterprise mode, uh, someone with, signif uh, with uh, significant uh, administration privileges would be able to go in and remove that file for you. In compliance mode, no, not even the top level administrator would have that access, meaning even if their accounts were compromised, uh, ransomware would not be able to encrypt or remove otherwise tamper with the files. We'll show you how to set this up in just a moment, but um, before we do, just another thing to cover. Uh, we've now added full volume encryption. Now, previously, you can encrypt individual file shares, but in 7.2, this is now an option on the, uh, on the volume and LUN level, um, which obviously means that if the physical drives themselves are taken out and stolen, there is still a backup, in, uh, sorry, there's still encryption in place on that volume. It cannot be, uh, cannot be read. Um, and we've also noted that uh, with full volume encryption, as opposed to individual folder share uh, encryption, there is up to a 48% increase in uh, sequential write access. And lastly, for this section, um, we, as I said, have rolled the WAM technology into our backup snapshots. So uh, immutable snapshots uh, are now available. As, uh, as with our standard snapshots, you set the frequency that they're taken um, and they're easy to restore to, but that information as well, you can set an immutable timer so that no snapshots can be tampered with within that, that, um, that period. And we'll show you how to set that up in just a second. I'm gonna hand over to James now, he's gonna show you how to set up Worm and uh, then also show you how to set up the immutable snapshots. Yeah, absolutely. So we've got a couple of uh, exciting demos to showcase. So actually, if I just jump over to my uh, my shared folder. So here we've got this uh, set up on a NAS uh, that is running DSM 7.2. And we've got a, uh, a folder here. So this is called important, do not delete. Um, of course, brilliantly named file, uh, brilliantly named folder. Um, of course, you don't have to name it that way. You can choose whatever name you want. But in here, I've also got a file that's called do not delete. So if I uh, open that up, and hopefully that's opened up on my other screen. So if I bring that over here, we can see there's just a nice simple text file that says uh, this is a test, hello world. Um, and we can just kind of make a bit of an edit in here. Um, so for instance, if we wanted to say, uh, please do not delete this important information. Now, if we wanted to save this, so uh, we can just uh, select Control Save. Um, and now actually, instead of just saving this, this is actually gonna try and save as. Now, if we don't change the, uh, the file name and we just try and click Save, uh, yes, we do want to replace it, but actually this is set to uh, read only. Um, so we actually can't uh, overwrite that file. Now, obviously that is something that we've had previously when we've had uh, just like a read only file, uh, read only format uh, to a folder, but we wouldn't actually ever be able to write back into, uh, into that folder. Now, what I can do here is actually if we change the name slightly. So if we said, uh, this is important information, and now we try and save this, we can see that now it actually has saved directly onto uh, onto the NAS. So yeah, it's uh, it is a really good way of uh, protecting all of that data. Now I hear what you're saying. How do we actually go about setting this all up? Well, if I jump onto the NAS, there we go. What we can do is uh, just the same way as we would normally set up a shared folder. We can go into Control Panel, select Shared Folder, and then under here we can select Create and Create Shared Folder. Now we can give this a, uh, a name. So again, uh, please do not delete my photos if we wanted to create a folder to share photos into. We'll click next. Now we've, the, uh, yeah, now we've got kind of a difference uh, in terms of the process. 
So in this case, we want to protect this shared folder with write once. Now, this is actually because, of course, we cannot roll back any file versions. This is actually going to uh, disable the recycle bin for us. So, uh, yeah, that won't be an option. We'll click yes, we're happy with that. And actually, now we can choose whether we want that uh, enterprise or compliance mode that, uh, that Les was mentioning earlier. So here we'll just uh, select compliance mode. Now, one thing to note is uh, any volumes, which these uh, read only, uh, sorry, these are mutable storage pools um, are uh, written onto, cannot be deleted um, because of course this, uh, this data is protected. Now we are going to create a, uh, an auto lock. Uh, so instead of having to go in and manually lock those, uh, lock those files individually, we'll automatically lock it. And actually what in this case, as soon as a file as photo is write, uh, written to it, um, I want it to lock immediately. But I also want to have these uh, photos remain locked forever because of course, if you've got baby pictures, you don't want them being overwritten no matter how long, uh, how long you have them for. Now, again, because these are photos, we won't be able to uh, append them. Uh, so we won't be able to add on to the end of those files. So here we'll also select immutable. And once we're happy with those settings, we'll click next. Now, of course, we've got data checksumming enabled automatically because this is, uh, these files are going to be stored for a very long time. But again, we could uh, enable file compression and also a shared folder quota if, uh, if we wanted to. But here, I'm just going to leave those blank. And again, once we're happy, we'll just go over all of our settings. Yep, we're happy with all of that. We'll click next. Again, it's going to make a prompt to say that, yeah, any volumes that all of this data is written to cannot be deleted. But um, yes, we're happy with that. So we'll click continue. And that is now going to create it for us. So all we've got left to do is uh, just put in our permissions there. So we'll just select admin and guest, which uh, are actually turned off at the moment on this system. But my user here will put read write and we'll click apply. And there we go, it's now all created. So of course, yeah, as, uh, as Les mentioned, the other side of, uh, of the worm storage is that we can now do uh, full immutable backups, which is a, a really kind of key uh, tool for protection against ransomware. <clears throat> so on this exact same NAS, if I jump back onto the NAS quickly, there we go. Uh, find my cursor again, there we go. So what we can do, um, actually on this particular NAS, I've got, let's go open this up, we've got Microsoft 365 backup running onto this. So this is actually for our internal office. Um, we've got a couple of different bits and pieces that are, that are being protected. Again, ignore the oranges. Microsoft Teams is a weird one when it comes to, uh, when it comes to backups, but that is all being backed up nice and safely and securely onto, uh, onto our NAS. Now, if we want to actually take uh, some immutable uh, backups of this, so actually I want to have that secondary protection. So if you've seen my uh, uh, backup of Office 365 um, webinar previously, great webinar. If you want to learn more about that, please do go and have a watch of that. Nice little self, uh, self plug there. Um, but yeah, if you, uh, if you want to kind of build up that style of workflow, what we're going to do is we're going to open up a snapshot replication. Now here, what we want to do is we want to uh, create a replication task and I'll create a new task here. So we'll select a remote folder because obviously we're backing this up onto a, uh, a different system and I will just check the, uh, the name of or the IP address just to make sure I've got the right system. So we'll just put in the IP address of that one there. Now again, we can have an encrypted connection if we wanted to, but as this is all internal, um, we're not too worried about that. Um, but we'll also select authenticate. So this is now going to let us sign into, uh, into that destination system. So we'll put in our login credentials there. Now that's going to say that, yep, we've connected. So we'll click next. And now once this loads, There we go. We can now choose uh, where we want this uh, where we want this all to be stored. So onto volume one is uh, is perfect on that destination system. And actually, what we want to do is we want to select the shared folder where our active backup for three six five data is being stored into. Now I'll select next. All of this is going to be very familiar for you guys if you've ever set up a snapshot replication task before. But here is going to be where it differs. So right down at the bottom, we've got immutable snapshots down here. So this means that these uh, snapshots are going to protect it, be protected, they cannot be written over, cannot be deleted um, until the uh, protection period is up. 
Now, our internal policy isn't actually that uh, kind of because this is non-critical data. It's not really too much of a uh, too much of a worry. But we do want at least 30 days worth of retention. Um, so we'll just put in 30 days here. We'll select next. And then again, because we don't really need that uh, any additional protection, we'll also just change this retention policy to, uh, to, to 30 days as well. And we shall select next. Now, once we're happy with that, we'll click next, make sure we've got all of our settings all OK. And we'll click done. And yeah, it's as simple as that. Now that means that that uh, data is going to be replicated from system one to system two. So our primary backup is going to be uh, moved or replicated from primary to secondary. And it's also going to a read only and immutable style. So it means that, yeah, it cannot be overwritten and cannot be changed uh, within, that, uh, within that period. So there we go. And now it's going to start doing our replication for us. And uh, yeah, it's all as simple as that. Thanks very much for that, James. I'm going to move on to the, uh, the next section now. We're going to talk about the improvements to uh, our storage features. Of course, uh, storage being the key function of what we do. First thing that I'd like to talk about is uh, new in 7.2. Petabyte storage is now something that can be configured in BTRFS. Uh, in 7.1 and before, um, petabyte volumes were supported, but you had to use uh, a separate file system, the peter, petabyte file system. Um, this has now been removed. The functionality has all been rolled back into our native BTRFS um, and will be stable in that form going forwards. Now, there are some requirements if you want to set up a petabyte sized volume. Um, firstly, you will need to have 64 gigabytes of RAM in your system. Uh, and secondly, you will have to set up the disks in a RAID 6 array. Um, but if you can meet those, uh, those standards, then you can now set up petabyte sized volumes in BTRFS. Another thing that I want to mention quickly, this doesn't mean that we will automatically upload, uh, sorry, update to your existing uh, petabyte volumes in previous versions. So you may need to recreate those pools if that's a feature that you think you're going to need. Another new feature um, that we've added for 7.2 is we've improved the way that we can work with SMB multi-channels. Uh, in, uh, in our SMB multi-channels, um, if you have multiple connections between the NAS device and the switch and between the switch and the end user devices, uh, the data can effectively be split between the uh, multiple channels. Um, by splitting the data, you're, you're doing two things. Firstly, you're increasing the amount of, uh, of space on that line that you can push the data down, allowing it to be pushed down faster. And you're also splitting that communication across multiple lines of communication which means that if anybody's able to listen to one of your, uh, your lines for any reason, they're not getting the complete information, thus meaning that it is more secure as well. Uh, and we've had some, uh, some pretty impressive results um, in improvements, uh, sorry, performance improvement uh, for this. Um, now bear in mind, these are under lab conditions, but uh, in one example of testing, uh, we were able to get a 290% performance increase in, uh, in writing files over SMB multi-channel. Another new feature is uh, that the uh, 7.2 devices can now perform inline data deduplication. Uh, in 7.1 and before, it would only do offline data deduplication. Uh, the difference being that um, with, uh, with offline data deduplication, a task is run that finds duplicate data and then clears it down after the fact. With inline, it can now process duplicate data um, and reduce this while it is writing, uh, thus giving you immediately the benefits of that. Um, if your drives are getting towards the, uh, the more sort of uh, full end of the spectrum, this could be quite useful if you're trying to upload large files. Um, if you have inline data deduplication enabled, uh, the offline data deduplication is still performed on the schedule. This is just an optional extra that you can add, and we'll show you how to do that right now. Absolutely. So we've got a uh, another system that we've got set up here. So this is actually a system that does. Uh, yeah. So one thing to actually note is that um, uh, data deduplication is only available on certain models. So do please check our knowledge base uh, if, uh, if if uh, if you're unsure about that. And um, but when you are on one of those systems, so like this SA thirty four hundred, if I go into Storage Manager, we can see we've got Volume four down here, which is a, a volume located wholly on Synology SSDs. We can see that we're using about 237 megabytes worth of uh, worth capacity of this uh, this at the moment. 
So what we'll do, we'll uh, select configure data deduplication and we'll uh, enable automatic deduplication. So we'll click save. And now what we can do uh, is we can double check to make sure we can see how much data we're saving on here. So we've got a couple of different presentations that I'm currently working on. So we've got this uh, root webinar that I was working on uh, a couple of months ago, if you saw that one. Um, and then also this uh, DSM 7.2 webinar. Now we'll also just uh, sign into the NAS to make sure that we can uh, find the file, uh, the folder path that we want to. And once this connects, there we go. So we've got a folder here, it's called deduplication, and that is being stored 100% on, uh, on the NAS, or on that uh, um, volume, sorry. If I just copy those files across there, we can now see that this is going to uh, copy all of those files in. Now, again, I don't need you guys to sit here to, uh, to wait for 400 megabytes worth of files to uh, transfer. So we've gone ahead and uh, kind of skipped that process. But right here we are right at the end. We can now see all of our four files are there. And now we can double check to make sure this is actually deduplicating it properly. So if we jump back onto the NAS. We can now see that we're taking up only 520 megabytes. So it's only gone up by about 300 megabytes or so, less than even. Um, and we can see that we're actually deduplicated savings of 550 megabytes or nearly 78%, which is uh, really kind of key. Now, alongside this, we can also go into uh, the deduplication shared folder. And if I just open this, we can see that actually the, uh, the size of the shared folder is 1.09 gigabytes. But actually on that volume, we're only storing 500 uh, or so megabytes. So uh, yeah, it's a really kind of powerful, powerful feature. There we go. Thanks again, James. Before I continue, um, just want to um, just want to ask the chat. Uh, I can see that people are sending questions through to the chat, direct messaging to us. Again, just so that they're not lost at the end, please use the, the ask a question function. Uh, those are retained. We'll come back to those afterwards. If it's uh, in the chat, even if it's direct to us, we might miss it. So please, guys, just get those questions into us in that way um, so that we can make sure that you get answers. Um, but moving on, um, this feature is uh, something for our home users and uh, small businesses to get excited about. Um, we now support storage pools for M2 SSDs in several of our models. Uh, previously, the uh, M2 SSDs were exclusively for read-write cache, which does increase the performance of uh, read-write on the larger volumes. Um, but if you need a small amount of dedicated, very fast storage, uh, for example, things like if you're um, if you're uh, hosting VM disks on the uh, on the device, um, and if you work in perhaps photos or uh, or CAD three D design, and you need just a small amount of very very fast storage, this is now something that might be of a great amount of benefit to you. Um, and we'll show you just how much now. Yeah, absolutely. So of course we've done uh, we've gone ahead and done a heck of a lot of uh, performance testing on uh, on these systems. I mean. I don't need you guys to go and sit here and wait because it does take a, a little while for, for all of this testing to, uh, to complete. Um, so we'll leave that there. But um, in our testing, we did actually see some, uh, some really impressive numbers. So previously, so this is all taken off a, a DS1522+, plus, so a five-bay system. And when it was full of uh, SATA SSDs, the two and a half inch SSDs, we were able to average about 790 megabytes per second um, in terms of peak, uh, peak read-write performance. But then if we compare that to the new NVMe SSDs, so the, uh, the M.2 volume, um, we can actually see that, yeah, we've gone over 1,000 megabytes per second. So essentially, just with a few less drives, um, we're actually hitting near 10 gigabit line speeds on just two drives, which is a, a really kind of, um, uh, yeah, really kind of powerful, a powerful sit uh, tool. Um, yeah, and this, especially this is only a, uh, a five base system. Obviously, if we're looking at some of our eight base systems, which are even more powerful, um, potentially there's even more kind of uh, room to grow on top of that. The last major section that we'll cover is the uh, notification integration, um, which for me as an exit ad uh, was particularly exciting. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but um, I receive lots of emails. Uh, I receive lots of calls. Uh, I get lots of notifications through our, our various ticketing systems that we use here at Synology. Um, but the go-to, if I need to respond to something quickly, the first thing I see is that badge that won't leave me alone in the corner until I've read it. Um, instant messenger apps are a great way of getting information to the right people uh, in a timely manner and something that's easy to respond to. Um, 
The other feature to this, you can set alerts only for the, the events that you care about and direct those to the right personnel. Uh, so you're not bombarding your teams with information that they don't need. You're sending specific notifications for specific events to the people that might need to action them. Uh, and finally, you can set custom notifications that make sense to your teams. Uh, you know, every, every office has got their own sort of terminology for things. Um, those, you know, that built up from uh, office culture. So if the wording is slightly different and will make sense to your teams, you can put that in there. Uh, and I also say as a tip, um, you can put things like reference numbers to uh, internal knowledge base articles so that you can include the how to fix it in with your notification. So at the moment, we focused on Teams, as I think we'll all agree, the largest uh, internal office communication tool. Um, you can directly integrate our alerts with the Teams system uh, with, uh, with direct notifications for the events that you choose. And you can tailor that down to who needs to see it uh, and, uh, and which events are worth reporting. In addition to Teams, we also support Line straight out of the bat. Not so big here in the UK, but if you have colleagues out in, uh, in Asia, then uh, they might appreciate that functionality. Um, and now that the framework is there, the intent is very much to bring more and more platforms to it. Uh, I don't have roadmap information for which ones are coming and when, but all of the big players are already being discussed. We'd like to hear from you guys, really. Let us know which ones you're most excited to hear about, which ones you're using in the office uh, and would like us to, uh, to integrate with first. Um, so by all means, reach out via the feedback forms um, or uh, inquiries. However, you can get in contact with us. We love this kind of feedback uh, and we will be pushing this through to our development team. I'm going to pass back over to James. He's going to show you how to actually set up one of these notifications uh, and then show you it in practice. Yeah, absolutely. So if we uh, kind of look back onto our NAS, so we'll also just get rid of the uh, snapshot replication. Um, now, obviously, we've created that snapshot replication task, so it'd be really good to get some notifications um, regarding that, uh, how that's kind of progressing. Now, again, as previously, we'll go down to the notifications, uh, but if I open up rules, we can actually see this is going to look very differently to the old 7.1 uh, and previously. Now we've kind of done this, so you actually create a rule and then assign it rather, um, to the kind of uh, yeah where where you want it to go, rather than how we did it previously, where we kind of did everything all in one go. So now this means that you can have loads of different rules all going to different places, and uh, yeah, you can kind of uh, really granularly control everything. Now what we'll do, uh, we'll click add, and uh, we'll also create a snapshot. I forgot how to type snapshot then replication notification there we go and what we can do is we can deselect absolutely everything but then we can go back into snapshot replication and if we want to get every notification from snapshot we'll just go in and select all of these so once we've done that we'll click add and now we can see this now pops up at the bottom of our list now, obviously, as Mez, uh, as Mez do apologise. <laughs> as Les mentioned, uh, I can't speak this morning. Apparently, I need more coffee. Um, as Les mentioned, of course, being able to push those notifications uh, out to all of our relevant uh, relevant teams is uh, is really kind of key. And we can do this uh, by what's called a, a webhook within uh, within the NAS. So the first thing to do, so actually I'm going to push this out to my teams. So when I'm out and about, I'll still be able to get all of the uh, notifications from this system. So the first thing we need to do is uh, create a webhook within Teams. Now at the bottom, you can see a, a URL, which is what we've copied. And uh, that is what we'll actually use to interface between the NAS and, uh, and Teams. So back on the NAS, what we can do is we can go into webhooks. There we go. And we can click add. And we'll now choose which uh, platform that we want to interface with. So obviously Microsoft Teams here. And we'll also choose which rule we want to uh, we want to push out. So we'll choose snapshot replication notification. That rolls off the tongue lovely. Um, and what we can do is we can give this one a name. So we'll call this Synology DSM snapshot. And then we can actually just customize the, uh, the actual message that we get. So we get a new snapshot event has occurred. And if I go back and find my URL that we've taken out of Teams, we can now paste this 
into our webhook URL and we can click apply. So that's now created it. So what we can do, we can select it. And just to make sure everything's working, we can uh, send a test message. Now this is going to um, push it out onto Teams. And if I open up Teams in front of you, there we go. So 11.03 just now, a new snapshot event has occurred on your DSM. This is a test message from that system. So we know that everything's working and uh, yeah, every single notification from Snapshot will now be pushed onto, uh, onto my Teams. Before we move on, I do want to add, uh, I forgot to mention earlier, of course, we do support our own chat app as an integration uh, feature as well. Uh, you can push notifications to our chat app, uh, which is a good solution if you're a little bit more, um, if you're a little bit more privacy concerned, uh, as our chat is, uh, can be enabled to be encrypted. And of course, no data is leaving the, uh, the internal network. So move on to the final section, we'll just talk about a few other cool features that have been added. Again, this isn't an exhaustive list. Please check out the website uh, for all of the features that are added in 7.2. Um, but we've, uh, we've, removed, uh, we've removed a few of the uh, individual storage contain uh, script containers such as Docker and combined them into Container Manager. Um, there are a few out there, Docker being the most popular one, but we decided if we were to combine them all, it would uh, be less of a, uh, a management overhead for, for end users. Uh, so that now all falls under the one container manager, uh, which should be a little bit more user friendly. Uh, we've also made a few changes to Synology Photos. Uh, the Android edition of Synology Photos now uh, supports WebP and uh, Motion Photos. Uh, and we've just given the, uh, the overall user experience uh, just a little bit of a facelift uh, for some ease of use. Finally, Hybrid Share. Hybrid Share was available in uh, 7.1, but we've added a few new features to it which should make it uh, a bit more useful for you guys, including the global file locking to prevent conflicts when you've got multiple people in multiple locations working on the same file. 